following up on a video I produced several months ago talking about technology addiction and my own attempts at adjusting my smartphone behavior by switching my phone screen over into a grayscale black and white mode. We got a number of questions from people asking about the actual science behind making a move like that. If removing color from a screen really would reduce those dopamine reward hits our brains get whenever we pick up our smartphones. Taking a look at the science, digging deeper to see if there's any research to support this internet hypothesis, I figured what better way to examine this question than to drive down to UCLA and have a sit down conversation with Dr. Timothy Fong, a psychiatrist in the neurology department of UCLA, and he was kind enough to spend some time explaining where we're at in terms of technology research. We're on the bleeding edge of digital mental health, and he shared his thoughts on the effectiveness of my grayscale screen smartphone experiment. Dr. Fong, um, thank you so much for joining us. This is a topic I've been really excited to follow up on just based on my own experiences tinkering with my own brain. Um, would you uh, would you mind briefly describing some of the research you've been doing here at UCLA? Absolutely, and thanks for having me. Let me turn my phone off. <laughs> I've uh, got notes up. It's not that I'm checking Twitter or anything okay. like that while you're talking. Uh, I'm a uh, addiction psychiatrist here at UCLA. I'm the co-director of our UCLA Gambling Studies Program, as well as our addiction uh, psychiatry fellowship and clinics. And over the last 15 years, as I've been seeing patients, one of the new things that has evolved is people who call with questions about, do I have an addiction to video games, to, to gambling, to pornography. But in the last couple of years, we've seen more and more people calling and saying, I have trouble regulating my cell phone usage. And with that, it's things like news aggregation sites. It's exactly. things like social media opportunities. So as an addiction psychiatrist, we've been gathering more clinical information and stories about men and women who develop pathological and unhealthy relationships with their phone. I call it an addictive disorder. We're not quite sure what exactly is going on uh, mm -hmm. with their brains and their minds. But at the end of the day, when they tell us their stories, they're struggling with depression, sleep deprivation, anxiety, low self-esteem, and the cell phones aren't making their lives better. So that's some of the work that we're doing. This is so raw that we're still even trying to find the terminology. Absolutely, absolutely. Very new, leading edge. And if there's something even leading edge about a leading edge, that's what would be it. So if you ask insurance agencies, hey, I have a patient with cell phone addiction, will you reimburse me for service? They'll say, no, no such disease exists. Gotcha. Inside our handbook that we diagnose men and women with mental illnesses, there is the term internet use disorder okay. that's in the appendix. But it's really talking about using the internet to play video games. It's not talking about cell phone usage and social media and apps and things like that. So much has to be explored. There are very few research centers I am aware of that are actually looking at this issue of digital health and digital mental health. Um, but there'll be more and more folks looking at this. This is as we see more and more instances in society where we need to figure out what exactly is going on. And I think particularly as society says, we need to establish some basic guidelines and right. rules and etiquette or uh, standards or prevention techniques. I mean, there's not a household in America that doesn't have this conversation. Turn that phone off. <laughs> right. Get off exactly. that right now, will you? <laughs> and what's happened in the last five years, I noticed, is not just parents to children. Right. Now it's children saying that to parents, children saying that to grandparents. It's cross-generational. I think that's a really important thing to focus on. So real quick, just to kind of show you what I was working with. Um, so this is what my phone screen looks like. It's small on mine is. <laughs> but, and, you know, and, and so, um, oh yeah, you got to yeah. have bigger, yeah. right? Bigger yeah. is super important yeah. these days. Um, but one of the, the most immediate things that took me by surprise wasn't, um, you know, like, oh, well, my phone's so much more boring now. Yeah. It was how little iconography meant to me. Mm -hmm. Like swirling circles didn't mean as much as yellow splotch, red splotch, blue splotch. Um, but this is this is how I normally use my phone throughout mm -hmm. the day now unless I'm trying to show something off. And, and how long have you done it this way? Um, about five months now. And has it cut down on the amount of time you use it? Has it cut down on the kind of wasted time where you start searching and messing around with I think with so. Stuff? I, I, so there's a, I mean, obviously this looks a lot less interesting. Mm -hmm. So if I pull up Instagram, you know, black and white is stunning for photography. Yeah. And if someone takes a good color in photo, it's going to be a good looking photo in black and white. Yeah. But it's that thing where I, I, I used to reply to one notification on my phone. Mm -hmm. And then an hour later, I'd find myself like deep dive on Twitter. Right. You know, this is still in the realm of bro science. Yeah. yeah. Know, internet science. Right. 
and I'm not sure whether or not it's because I'm actually willing myself. Like I have a desire to change my behavior. Mm -hmm. Is this really contributing to that desire or is this more of a, a placebo and it's a reminder to me that I'm, you know, like kind of like rubber band yeah. therapy or something right. like that. Well, go back to the very beginning. When you did this, what was the intent? Were you saying, I need to cut down on my cell phone use? Or were you saying, I want a healthier relationship with my phone and its apps? Definitely the second one. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, recently the father of a, of a young child. You know, my wife and I just had our first kid. And mm -hmm. I was looking for, I want more meaningful interactions with my gadgets i'm mm -hmm. doing this thing where I, I i'll be on the couch and then two hours have just evaporated right or same thing on my laptop you know yeah. i go to do one thing mm -hmm. and then i like have a blackout period <laughs> right and kind of wake up later having exhausted reddit so i mean it's interesting because you know i have a similar one and obviously mine's all in color uh, <laughs> what you're touching on is a brand new area of neuroscience psychology and psychiatry and it's an area that we call digital health or digital mental health, if you will. Um, for thousands of years, you know, we as humans have had relationships with inanimate objects, you know, actual personal feelings. You call it clothes we wear, the toys we play with, you know, everything from, from the time we were cavemen. In no other time in human history do I think we've created such a device that has such intense emotional feeling, good, mm -hmm. bad, ugly, everything in between. And I think about my own experiences growing up as a child of the 80s, Right. Generation X compared to millennials um, is totally different. And so as we were reflecting before, you know, some of the concerns of our parents growing up was your brain's going to turn to mush. You're going to be uh, wasting away. Your grades are going to go bad. Or, or even just uh, like less concern over even the brain. I, exactly. I mean, like I was sitting too close to the TV. You know, you, you, I was going to go blind. Right, you can go blind. Yeah. Exactly. It was very concrete fears. What's different now, I think, is because these are indispensable tools in our lives. They're never going away. Right. And because how fast technology advances, and we don't know how the brain responds to those advances in technology, uh, we don't know what the next 15, 20 years. What I look at from my standpoint as an addiction psychiatrist is pretty simple. When people's relationship with objects or behaviors or activities goes into the zone of unhealthy, harmful, destructive, that's an addiction when it makes their life better, when they have a better quality of life, when they do things quicker, faster. That's not an addiction. That's a hobby. That's a passion. That's increased productivity. Right. That's the difference between someone saying, OMG, I check my phone all the time. I'm right. totes addicted. Exactly. Versus someone who's displaying, in your opinion, self-destructive behavior. Exactly. So I'll give me an example. So we saw someone in our clinic last week, a UCLA student who chief complaint was that I'm on too many social media devices and I can't get anything done. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, his GPA had really sank. His friendships, human relationships were very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. A lot of time spent on mm -hmm. the internet. And he basically said, I couldn't stop looking. I kept looking for the last page of the internet. Right. So not exercising, poor sleep, constant urges and cravings in a negative way. This is not healthy. Right. These are not normative signs. What you've done is an interesting tactic. It modifies behavior because you began to recognize this is something I don't really like. I don't like my life being consumed by an activity. Right. Call it drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, video games, internet, information. And I'm going to modify it in a way that's going to keep my relationship boundaries at bay. That hasn't been tested. We don't know if that works for everyone. It works for you. Right. Because for you, for whatever reason, it shuts off the noise. But I think it probably serves as a clear reminder very quickly. This is just a phone. Right. This is just a vessel for information. What I'm reminded there very interestingly of is the Sunday newspaper. So growing up, I remember <laughs> exactly. the right. best thing about the Sunday newspaper was that it was in color and the comics were in color and you actually spent more time going through each thing. Right. That's kind of what you've done. Is that you haven't changed the information available or the speed of which you can get. You changed the formatting, which not that it made it less interesting, but it made it less automatic less reflexive, less, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, well, what's this? What's bing, 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 bing. So, but what you're getting to is this is larger discussion that we're not having as a society about digital etiquette, digital health, where does it end? Because what's different is the amount of information you can get on that phone is the entire human experience. Right. It's incredible compared to when I was a kid. 
64K computer. <laughs> exactly. Which is very, I, I grew up on an old DOS. Exactly. Right. And so exactly. the thing that people are addicted to is information. Just like you think about what are people addicted to when it comes to alcohol or drugs or gambling. They're addicted to the process. They're addicted to how that behavior makes them feel. Mm -hmm. And they're addicted to the access. So it's less the delivery, or, or is the delivery mechanism now why we're starting to see more discussion? Oh, absolutely. The delivery, how fast it is, the innovation, the novelties, uh, those are all what's compelling people to be constantly on the hunt. So example, you know, I, I see my friends or when I go out with my, my family and I watch people constantly checking and you ask them, what's the reason you're checking it so often? They can't articulate. They say, well, I don't want to miss anything. FOMO, you know, I don't, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I need to be part of it. I feel like I need to be connected. Mm -hmm. Those are not signs of addiction. Those are signs of false idea of what a relationship really is. Okay. This idea that I constantly have to be right there in the moment. That if I'm not part of the leading edge or the most relevant news at the time, somehow I'm less than important or somehow I will miss out, which means that my life will somehow be no good. Right. Another fascinating story, and this is a great story, it's worth the time. I was in the UCLA gym in the sauna a couple months ago, and these two undergrad guys were there, and they were talking about how they were using Instagram and how they met uh, a woman in class. And he's like, oh, and she was really great, and I got her, I invited her on Instagram, and she took so long to get back to me. <laughs> and I said, I'm like, what's up with this girl? What's the matter with you? And the other guy said, hey, how long did it, she get back to you? 12 hours. <laughs> so he right. said 12 hours was too long to right. establish connection. Whereas, you know, when, when I was going to college, a movie like Swingers, it'd be like, oh, you don't want to call her back for at least two days. That's right, exactly. <laughs> All right. So the idea is that we've also created these new rules right. that aren't written down, that in some ways are absolutely um, not attainable. Well, and, and do you find that it's not even so much that we can create a rule anymore? Because I, I know in our coverage recently, it's been the rule is this behavior will change when the next hot new app or service comes out. And then we kind of throw out, you know, what Twitter etiquette was so that we can now talk about Snapchat etiquette. Exactly. You know, younger people are starting to evade some of the communication aspects of Facebook right. to look at more short form and disposable right. entertainment or communication. Methods. My big concern as, again, as an addiction psychiatrist is that we know that there's going to be a significant number of people in the population. We don't know what that number, but probably around one to two percent, mm -hmm. where their lives, because of cell phone and because of technology, will become very, very much harmed. Just like with folks when video games came out, or when pornography turned into uh, VCRs. Right. Anything that could be potentially highly rewarding and that's highly available, highly accessible, does have the potential to become addictive to some. So the questions that we get a lot are from parents to say, well, how do I manage this for my kids? Mm -hmm. Or from kids themselves, well, how do I manage my parents? <laughs> so I think it goes back to this simple uh, but difficult idea to realize that this is still ultimately a utility tool. It's like mm -hmm. a screwdriver. It's like a vacuum cleaner. Right. It's like a phone. It is a phone. It is a phone. <laughs> um, it's like the least used part of it is the it's phone. It's supposed to be <laughs> our lives easier, better, and more enjoyable. And it right. does. For the vast majority of time. The battle comes in when you have such constant flow of information. It's that paradox of choice. You have too much to look at and then you end up drifting into dissatisfaction. And I right. think that's why some of the academic studies that have looked at Facebook users who use way more, they're depressed, they're anxious, yeah. they, they don't sleep well. And that's true for any social media app. And that's also true for any video game. So what's interesting is that with the phone, we can access not just any addiction, but all addictions, right. drugs, alcohol, gambling, hypersexual behavior, all via the phone. So the phone is both not only the thing that you become addicted to, mm -hmm. but it's also a vessel that leads you to your other addiction. I'm glad you brought up just the notion of other addictions being sort of influenced by accessibility. Is there a component to sort of mobile addiction or internet addiction which, you know, someone might be trying to treat something else going on mm -hmm. in their lives and that maybe the, the tether to their phone isn't necessarily the actual problem. They're yeah. trying to self-medicate. Absolutely, absolutely. Else. So again, it's the vessel. So 
imagine someone with a gambling problem, they just use their phone to access casinos and place mm -hmm. bets. Whereas 15 years ago, you had to drive four hours to the casino. Right. Now I can do it while I'm at work and gamble my entire life savings. So the technology has allowed access to that world of addiction so much quicker. Mm -hmm. um, one of the real challenging parts is then how do you tell patients to get rid of their phones or to limit their access so that they can't have to live the rest of their natural lives. So as an example, I have a patient who you know relies on her phone because she's a traveling salesperson. Right. And she needs maps and calling people, but she's also a, a pathological gambler uh, and she's constantly on the phone placing bets and you know, uh, doing those online games. So it's a real challenge. But what's fascinating with the, the way we have our phones right now is not only are they potentially an addictive source, but they're potentially also the treatment for addiction. Okay. So we have uh, actually several really interesting apps that are in development or things out there right now that brings treatment and recovery into the phone. Okay. So as an example, I only see patients, you know, once a week, once a month. But the fact that the phone could be your guide, your ego, if you will, mm -hmm. your treatment source, your sponsor in some ways, to really help manage your, your health and behavior, that's an amazing thing. Right. That's why so many people are using these fitness apps and exactly. you know, things like that. In the recovery world of addiction, these are now apps that are starting to come true. So for instance, if you go by a bar uh, and the phone will notify you you're too close to alcohol, or let's wow. say you're in a traveling in a new city, here are the meetings that are open and available for you. The way I think about it is we've really, uh, we haven't studied the untapped potential of cell phone technology and abilities to improve our lives. Mm -hmm. And that is gonna be just so quick. Every, every week new things are coming out. Right. But at the same time, we also haven't really studied very well what is this doing to first the physical nature of our brains? Mm -hmm. And number two, what is it doing to our psychological makeup to our minds and how we view people? Uh, I have an 11 year old, uh, we have an 11 year old son and he's in sixth grade. A big debate over the last year was, shouldn't he get a phone? Right. And we I spent mean, my daughter just turned one. We're having she, that she conversation. Phone, right? yeah. and She's surrounded by glowing rectangles. We, talk about, my we talk about it all the time, and I don't have a good explanation. Uh, right. Parts of me say safety, tracking, he can participate in social experiences. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a phone, people kind of laugh at you. Yeah. I have two phones, this and I have an old flip phone. And every time I bring out the flip phone, people laugh at me and they kind of say, why do you hairy that? And it doesn't feel good. Right. And the flip side, exposing a young brain that's not fully developed to just infinite information, right. that's stimulating, that's confusing, that's um, no idea where it's coming from. What does that do to brain development? Right. So think back to why, when we were kids, again, there's a reason why we didn't watch R-rated movies. There's a reason we weren't allowed into adult theaters because we knew that information like that before you were mature would really warp how you view the world. It would warp your morality and your judgments. Mm -hmm. That's what's really fascinating, the idea that your daughter can now access really, really unbelievable images that you never would ever want her to see in her entire lifetime right. and get it pretty easily. We'd love to have NIH or other folks uh, provide funding to study this on a mm -hmm. research level. It's just not there yet. This is a brand new field inside of mental health that we're coining uh, digital health, digital okay. mental health. And I think very, very, very simply that cell phones offer both incredible promise to help improve our lives, but there's also a small part of it that could for those who are genetically vulnerable and psychologically vulnerable, really develop uh, this dark side of addiction behavior. Are there resources that people can tap to start reading up more if they were wanting to have a conversation with their physician or with their medical team? Not anything that I would call scientifically credible or scientifically validated. I would fold all of this under the rubric of just central mental health. Okay. And so my general rule of thumb is if you are struggling with what you believe to be behavior or your loved one is, and if it's causing stress, dismay, harm, arguments, tension, then that's worth an issue to talk to a mental health professional about, gotcha. irregardless of what's going on. If you're stressed, you're not sleeping, your mood is low, if you're anxious, you need to talk to somebody about that to figure out, do I have an addiction to cell phones? Do I have depression? Do right. I have ADHD? Do I have just a poor relationship with my family? Lots of possibilities there. So my anecdotal experience is we can kind of firmly put into the bucket of internet bro science for now there's nothing to really suggest that like 
it really did tinker with my brain chemistry more than just my own desire to change my behavior. I think so. I think as an example, one thing would be fascinating to image your brain both on cell phones and off cell phones or on certain apps when you're engaging versus other apps that you're engaging. Or very simply in your case, taking your phone first in color mm -hmm. and seeing what happens to your brain inside a brain scanner versus when you're using that phone in grayscale. And so then we'd also be able to see how much damage I've done to my brain by doing this. Uh, if that brain is actually still inside that head of yours, <laughs> yes, of course. Excellent. Thank you so much thank for you. taking the time. I really appreciate you uh, having this conversation with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank Dr. Fong for taking the time to speak with us. This is a topic I think is fascinating as technology rapidly outpaces our society's ability to come up with new etiquette to address these new methods of communication. And it should be reiterated that if you feel you have any issues with any kind of addictive behavior, that you seek out the advice of a trained medical professional. This is absolutely a topic I'll be looking to revisit in the near future. And if you've had any experiences that you'd like to share in managing your own internet consumption, definitely drop us a comment down below this video. As always, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel for more informative conversations like these and help us out with some sharing on your favorite social networks. For Pocket Now, I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, some gadget guy on Twitter and Instagram, and I will catch you all on the next video.